Andrew Pelling said one thing that really caught my imagination, and then I want to invite him out here to explain himself. Uh, but he said, creating living, functional, biological objects that do not exist in nature is one of the things that his lab tries to do. Andrew, come up and tell us why that's Thanks not Frankenstein. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mozart. Good to meet you. I'm constantly being asked to come out and explain myself, and so I'm, I'm very glad to do that today with, with all of you. I, you seem like a very friendly bunch of people, and I hope you'll um, just bear with me for a moment. I've got a little story to tell you about uh, what I did one weekend uh, a few months ago, and it, it starts on a Friday night, and I'm in the dollar store, and I see these chickens, and I don't know why, but something deep within me was absolutely fascinated by these things. I started to obsess over them. And I'm not the type of person to just buy one chicken or buy a box of chickens, but I bought all the chickens, every single chicken on the, on the shelf. And like any normal human being, I took a picture of this and I posted it on social media. <laughs> and so you can see I made a comment there, you know, $6 worth of chickens, I have plans. And what that means is that all of my responsibilities that weekend, all of my plans were now out the window. Now, plan A, <laughs> Plan A is do something with the chickens. Okay, so I bring these chickens home, and I bring them to my workbench, and, and I see yet another unfinished project. Uh, this one is, uh, involves these LEDs that I absolutely love. They're really easy to program, simple to put together, and the colors are super intense, and sometimes you see them branded as NeoPixels. Anyway, so I'm, I'm looking at the pixels, and then I'm looking at the chickens, and I'm looking at the pixels, and I'm looking at the chickens, and I realize, you know, what I have to do this weekend is put the chickens together with the pixels. And this is the moment when I invented, oops, when I invented, ah, <laughs> the chicksel. <laughs> Look at that delivery. Um, <laughs> so, Anyway, revised plan A is now do something with the chicksels. So of course, first step, go back to the dollar store where I discover that you can buy these perfectly engineered and designed chicken containers. So, <laughs> I mean, seriously. And so I bought them all. I, I go back home, I start to assemble these chicksels, I put together a little circuit board, programmed a microcontroller, invented this little thing, and you know, here is the result. Um, it's this object that displays light patterns and kind of shifts between disco mode and snake rainbow mode. And, you know, I, I take some video of this thing, and again, I post it on social media, and people go crazy. I mean, it blew me away. Somebody offered me $1,000 to buy this thing. And, and when parents see this, they often say to me, you know, my kids would love this thing. So, you know, the world didn't ask for the chicksels. Um, this solves zero problems. It has no <laughs> clear purpose. Um, and yet, and yet, I've established like a market value. I've, <laughs> I've established a, uh, an emotional value. So, you know, what's going on here? Like, why is this important? Why is it, was it, why was it important for me to clear out my entire weekend? I didn't eat, I didn't bathe, I just obsessed over this object. And, you know, you hear about people who practice meditation or practice yoga. You may, you may be one of these people. Practice musical instruments, practice singing, practice sports. And I've realized over the course of my life is something I've been doing is practicing curiosity. And I've gotten really well attuned to paying attention when my curiosity is peaked. And the second part of this is I've gotten really good at ignoring that little voice at the back of my head that's telling me I have more important things to do. And, <laughs> and so when this happens, when, when that moment happens, you never know when it's going to happen, I've just learned to follow it. I pursue that curiosity wholeheartedly, no matter what, even if I don't know where I'm going. And this is important because it makes me a better scientist. 
So my name is Andrew Pelling. I'm a professor and Canada Research Chair at one of Canada's top universities, and I run a research lab that's fundamentally interested in the limits of biology. We're really interested in understanding not just how biological systems work, but once we've learned those lessons, how much can we control and manipulate these things? Can we create new speculative biologies of the future? You know, can we engineer the human body with new senses and new, new types of tissues? What sort of questions can we ask? And a key element of our practice and of how we work is that we have to foster this spirit of creativity and curiosity. And sometimes these are very intangible things. It's hard to quantify these characteristics. And you would think that these would be forces that act in opposition to the rigor of the scientific method. But what we've learned over time is that when we can get these things acting in parallel, these forces acting in parallel, that's when discovery happens. And that's when we're able to generate new knowledge. And lucky for me, this is my job. And in fact, this is why I feel like I'm on this planet. And I've become, I'm really proud of my team. Over the last 10 years, we have created an environment where we absolutely thrive on diversity. We thrive on bringing every discipline into the lab, bringing in the expertise and perspectives. And we thrive on this because it allows us to ask more unconventional questions. It allows us to ask questions that haven't been asked before and approach them in ways that just haven't been imagined. And that usually, Sometimes that fails. I should say, actually, most of the time that fails. But uh, you know, you get these gems now and then, and, and these real successes that come out of this process of failure and learning. And so I want to tell you about one more project today, and it actually starts here. Does it have to be human? Does it have to be mine? Has everybody seen this movie? Where am I supposed to get it? Not enough of you. <laughs> This is an incredibly important movie. There's some serious Canadiana in there, and if you haven't seen it, this is now your job. Uh, <laughs> after today's events, <laughs> uh, go home and make sure you find a way to watch this movie. Um, this is a, it's a monster plant. This is, the, the plant's name is Audrey II. I won't go into why. Um, and it, this, 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 this creature is actually really interesting. Uh, you know, it, it, it sings and dances and it eats people, but uh, it's also, you know, part plant and part mammal, right? It's got these features that are very plant-like, but at the same time, it's got these teeth and it, it's got a voice and it's musculature and a blood supply. And a, a question came up, you know, could we grow this thing in the lab? That was the question. And so we were looking at another process. We started thinking about this whole thing. We were looking at this process known as decellularization. And what you see up there is actually a pig heart. It's been treated with various detergents and enzymes to remove all the cells uh, from that organ. And what's left is this protein scaffold. It's mainly actually collagen, the protein in your skin. And it gives all of your tissues and organs their shape and mechanical properties. So we thought, OK, let's take a leaf. We'll decellularize it, leaving behind cellulose, the fibrous part of any plant, and we'll grow some muscle into it. And then, you know, if we can get muscle fibers to grow in that leaf, maybe we can make it, you know, contract and do this. And, and you know, if we can make a mouth, then everything else is really easy. <laughs> and, well, it turns out that doesn't work so well, uh, and, and we did not succeed there. And as we were dissecting the problem and, like, figuring out why this didn't work, we realized, our detergents just weren't getting through the waxy coating that is found on all leaves. But the lead scientist who was working on this, Daniel Modulewski, he saw somebody, whoa, <laughs> he saw somebody one day eating an apple, and he realized, hey, what, what if I just peel away that waxy skin, I have access to that fleshy cellulose matrix, maybe I can decellularize it and grow cells on it. And this is one of our very first pictures, probably 2013, of a piece of apple where we've grown mouse muscle into that matrix. And if we look really close, you can kind of see um, these, this, the apple tissue is very porous, it's sponge-like, lots of little holes and, and crevices, and that's where cells can kind of get in and populate. It turns out you can grow all sorts of different species of cell types on there. You can, you can grow all sorts of cell tissue types on there. Um, and, you know, what this actually is, what we discovered, is, is what's known as a biomaterial. So the materials a medic might use to rebuild broken structures in the body or, or graft skin, that sort of thing, but made from plants. And so with the clear kind of medical implications of this, the next question is, well, is it safe to implant this material into the body? So we started a study where we 
implanted. We took apple, we, we decellularized it without any cells. We implanted under the skin subcutaneously in a mouse. Um, and what we discovered absolutely shocked us. Uh, healthy cells surrounding the, bi the biomaterial would start to invade inside of it. Blood vessels would form inside of this thing. And, and really, what was happening was this apple was becoming a living part of the mouse's body. The little arrows you can see up there are actually pointing at the cross-section of blood vessels. You can just see these little red dots, and those are blood cells, right? So this is fascinating to us. Um, and when we announced this work, it started to get a lot of attention, a lot of press, and primarily because uh, we could start asking another question, which is, are plants the future of regenerative medicine, right? Up until this point, traditionally biomaterials are made from synthetic petrochemical products, animal products, or, or even human cadavers, which are processed and then made into biomaterials. So there's all sorts of issues associated with those. And a couple of years ago, we spun out um, a company uh, which is now actually this summer heading into its first clinical trials in human beings to assess safety and biocompatibility. And we've assembled large teams of clinicians and hospitals, regulators, investors, and advisors to, to take this forward and explore the really serious and meaningful medical applications of this work. Now, I could spend another hour up here talking about those. Uh, I won't. <laughs> but um, I thought, you know, since this is Idea City, I wanted to actually chew on an, an idea I've had for a little while now, and I want to shift our focus a little bit, and we'll come back to this issue in a second. Um, I was uh, on sabbatical at Symbiotica, which is a, an, a biological research laboratory in Australia. It's run by Orrin Katz, and uh, he's holding a mouse here with, with an ear on its side. I don't know, how many of you remember this image, the, the famous ear mouse? It's about 20 years ago. Um, you know, artist uh, Stellar responded to that work by taking another biomaterial, a, a polymer, and creating a third ear on his, his arm by, you know, grafting, creating this ear implant and having it implanted under the skin. The mouse was um, an ear biomaterial made from, I believe, cow uh, cartilage. And so he and I were chatting and, and discussing, you know, these environmental and ethical issues of traditional biomaterials. And he asked me, you know, could you actually take an apple and, and carve an ear and, and use it in the same way as, as what's been going on for 20 years? And it, it turns out, yes, you can. You know, so this is what we did. Um, this is an apple. Uh, it's been processed and made biocompatible and implantable uh, as a tissue, as a biomaterial, but simply just from plants. So... Um, you know, as, as I've kind of been thinking about this a lot, uh, there's an element of this work that really fascinates me. That ear was hand-carved, okay? You could hand-carve it. Maybe you've got, you know, use a fabrication tool like a CNC or something to create it. Um, but there's no reason, if, you, if you're doing this, there's no reason why we have to just look at a normal ear, right? So the, if you consider this our base model human ear, um, you could then decide, okay, I, I, there's some aesthetic or cosmetic features of an ear that I would prefer. It would give me a better sense of self, for instance. Um, or, you know, we might even start to think, well, how could we actually modify the structure of the ear? You know, if you, if you put your hands up like this or like this, you can change what frequencies you're hearing. You can suppress or enhance different frequencies. So could we actually modify human hearing? And I know this sounds a little spe speculative and wild, but as I was preparing for this talk a few weeks ago, I realized, you know, I've got all the pieces. So I actually commissioned um, a company here in Toronto, Red Brick Rooster, to come up with these designs. So they created them for me. I then took these designs to the one person in my life who I know who carves wood, and that's my wife, actually. She's an instrument maker, and, and she took these designs and created uh, the, the biomaterials. I then took these biomaterials to my lab, and we processed them and made them sterile. That, don't freak out, that's not blood, that's just the color of the media we use. Um, and you can see this, this implant, it has kind of the texture and feeling of, of, of an ear. And really the next step is to put it in the body. And we're working on that part right now, on making sure this is safe. So it's actually not that far. And what's more fascinating is that this is already happening, right? You can put silicone horns in your head. You can implant electronics under your skin. You can do this at the tattoo parlor, right? That's where this can happen. The patient or an individual potentially could decide what that body part looks like and go to their local, local tattoo parlor and potentially 
modify and augment their body. This fascinates me. Um, and it fascinates me because I think <laughs> what we've actually discovered here <laughs> is an opportunity for artisanal, handmade, organic hipster body parts, right? <laughs> this is what we're talking about. <laughs> um, I love this work because there are very serious and very real medical implications, things that will change people's lives, but at the same time, it allows me to speculate and be curious about the future. And, and really, it's not that far away. In fact, we're putting the pieces in place for this. So I, I just want to kind of back up and, and remind everybody where this work came from, right? We were simply curious about creating Audrey II in the lab. That's where it all started. And what happened? Major scientific discoveries, major medical advances, a spin-out company, awards, international recognition, all from us simply being curious. And I'm immensely proud of my team of being able to marry you know, that creative and curious spirit that we cultivate in the lab to the rigor of the scientific method. These things go hand in hand, and they benefit one another. And we've only had success because my team has been able to execute on that so well. I fundamentally believe that our society doesn't value curiosity for curiosity's sake. Um, you know, Curiosity is one of these things that's primal to who we are as human beings. It doesn't matter where you were born, where you live, what your life path was, where you are on the globe today. We are all curious and inquisitive creatures. That's our shared humanity. There are so few things that we can literally point at and say, this is part of our shared humanity. And that's why it's important. I think we need to be doing more to be cultivating and fostering curiosity in our own lives. So, this is my challenge for you today. I want you to spend more time in the dollar store, <laughs> number one. And my challenge, I've, there's two reasons why I'm, I'm putting this out there for all of you. Um, the first one is very selfish, okay? If any of you happen to see these chickens anywhere, I really want to know about it, and I need as many eyes around the world looking for them because I want them. Uh, and the second is, the challenge that I want to give to you today is when you see something that piques your curiosity, I challenge you to sort of silence that voice and to pursue that curiosity, fiercely pursue that curiosity until you've satisfied it and you've found out what discoveries you can make. Thank you. Great Thank to meet you, you. Yeah, I'd like to visit your lab. Absolutely, anytime, yeah. all where, of you. Where are you located? I'm in Ottawa. Uh, okay, Most and, of and the time. Like, can you womp up a spare part over a weekend? Or? <laughs> we can. Yeah. Uh, bring some fruits and vegetables, Bible. So, uh, <laughs> this, this ear, this yes. ear, you say it's implantable. It is. Yep. And you're working towards that. Yep. So, are. you'll be able to come back and tell us whether you can actually make it work? We are. Um, I, uh, we're thinking very deeply about um, what these implants might look like and, and what they might be and, and you know, who on our team might be getting one in the next little while. Mm. <laughs> we're, we're having a good time with this right now and, and yeah, you get a laugh out of it, but the implication is really profound. Um, they absolutely this, are. this can lead to transplantable absolutely. organs, right? May, organs are a little victims, farther off. Skin, yep. Tissues, yeah. bone, nerves, soft tissues like your ear and noses, low cost, without the fact, without the need for animal product, human product. Uh, that, that there have been major controversies because of those, those types of sources. And potentially we have something that could be transformative here. Stunning, inspiring. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.